Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. This week, John Moret will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. We'll show you parts of the recent Hewerman Lecture held at UNL featuring four former U.S. Secretaries of Agriculture. Charles Wortman will discuss soil testing after a drought and will update you on how growers along the Missouri River are faring after last year's flooding. John Moret is our marketing analyst this week. We talked with John on Wednesday afternoon. While wind that day chased us inside, farmers had another day to work at a record-paced harvest. This is probably one for the ages, but we've seen a lot of uh, corn come off before the soybeans. Generally in this area, we'll almost always do soybeans, finish the soybeans, and go back out into the corn. And, and uh, this year, we've seen a lot of guys do corn, stop and do soybeans, and then go back to the corn. So really pretty good. We're probably 70% done with soybeans as of today, and somewhere around 30% on the corn. So We're talking at the end of Wednesday afternoon. A little volatile last week. Uh, corn gained back to finished about where it started the week, but what do you attribute that to and how we started this week? You know, a lot of the gains, I think we were overdone on the downside. I think there was people thinking that we would uh, continue to slide. The end users hadn't really stepped up. And then a couple things happened late last week. I think ethanol caught a bid, which helps in the cash market. And I think there's also the fear that maybe the yield isn't quite as good as we were thinking. Um, and it, it probably has taken a step up from the 120 or 122. And now we're right back down to probably in that 122 or 123 range. What do you expect to see next week when the USDA does its crop report? You know, we're going to see harvested acres come down, and that's been criticized a lot. Uh, but I think the yield will be real close to the 123 mark when we get all done. Beans, I think, and, and we can hit mm -hmm. on that too. Sure. Beans, we think, climb, and everybody's expecting that. Uh, and I'm no different. I think we're going to see somewhere around the 38 or 38 and a half bushel yield, and the market was not expecting that. Now, how can you have the drought of a century and produce 40, 50, 60 bushel soybeans? So it'll be fun to see. It'll be fun to see what the government comes out with and, and uh, the demand rationing continues. I've always heard people describe USDA as fun. That is exactly the way that they describe those reports. It's so much fun to see what they come up with. Uh, let's talk about demand rationing. Uh, we talked so much about this a few months ago, how people were going to have to ration demand for both corn and beans and how, how, tar how tough it was going to be. Uh, have we seen much of it going on? Does more need to happen? We have seen a lot of, of demand rationing start. Uh, I don't think we're finished yet. I don't think people fully understand the extent of this drought, um, but it has started. And I think we've seen it in several different sectors. Uh, livestock has done some unique things. Uh, we've brought in some canola meal for the first time ever in our history and, and used that in the rations. And I think that's just one example of how people are gonna get creative on how to get through. And so if they're gonna continue to feed, I think they've found alternatives and I think it's gonna find different feeds to, to take place of corn or soybeans or soybean meal. So it has started, yes. Let's move into ethanol, what you see there over the next month, perhaps, and uh, if there's a shakeup in the elections, maybe how that would change into the first of next year. You know, I think, uh, I think the ethanol plants are gonna continue to run. They've, they've got a place in our business. They've got a place in the nation now. Um, they're gonna stay right in there running. Now, the, the poor plants, the ones that aren't paid down, I think they're gonna continue to stay shut down or, or limited running. And so they might be on three months and off one. But I do think it's going to stay there. As far as the election, you know, I don't think we'll see much change in ethanol policy. The EPA is going to make their decision in the next month, you know, shortly after the election. So we'll find out if, if they want to waive the mandate or not. We probably don't need to waive the mandate, would be my guess. Uh, we, we see that there's uh, plenty of corn domestically to grind up and, and feed the ethanol. 
Uh, we're, we're currently not exporting any corn, so you know if you're not going to feed it to livestock, it's going to go into an ethanol plant. So overall, in the stock market, strong third quarter. Some people are worried though that this is now time for a pullback. If it does in fact pull back, how far do grains go with it, and do they go at all? You know, I actually that's an that's an interesting subject. In fact, that's one that's really driving our soybean market down today, which is the, the funds and the index guys are saying, hey, I'm out of beans. I, and, and there's really two reasons for doing it. Number one, they already had a run. Uh, number two, we found out the soybean crop's a little bigger. They've really got the same problem in corn. You know, we added a lot of contracts between the beginning of July to the end of August, and now you really have to find something bullish for them to come back in and buy, both in corn and soybeans. So if there is additional buying in the fourth quarter from the fund side, we think it's going to be relatively limited. Um, in fact, there's probably going to be more of a tendency to roll existing positions, which can put some pressure on the front end of the market. So, As you look towards 2013, how much does South America play into what people should think about doing there? Well, I think it's everything, and, and we're coming off again a drought here in the U.S. We all know that. Um, we, well, we've got to watch South America, and if they have a drought, if they stumble like we did, soybeans are going to run, corn's going to run, because it's more imperative that we get acres planted and that the weather cooperates accordingly. Uh, I think about Christmas time will be the key. Uh, there's no doubt they're going to have a scare at some point, but if, if you wake up Christmas and, and it's hot and dry in South America, that's your Christmas present because you're going <laughs> you're gonna to go sharply higher. But, if they have normal weather on the flip side, you know, they can grow us out of the bean crop and I think they can have enough corn and beans back in the pipeline by, you know, February, early March. And so we can kind of satisfy world demand if we need to. And, you know, on the same note, you know, we, we talked soybeans before in demand. If you have, uh, if we take 85% of all the soybeans we grew, they need to be in the pipeline by the end of February. You know, that's a remarkable feat. So when people talk about how tight this really is, that means I've got to go convince a guy to get his soybeans out of a bin if the snow is blowing. So it can be a difficult task on the soybean side. Let me quickly ask you about basis numbers. Do you expect them to strengthen hard after we get done harvest? You know, I think basis numbers um, will continue to stay strong. I don't know if they get much better than this. Uh, we've got a lot of funny movements in grain this year. North Dakota is going to move into Nebraska. North Dakota is going to move to Illinois. I think both those moves are going to be a challenge. Um, for local bases here in Nebraska. Nebraska is going to hold their own on corn and it feels like other people are going to come in and take some of our front away. So. Next week we'll talk with Wade Johannes from Central Valley Ag after the USDA releases its October crop report. Four former U.S. Secretaries of Agriculture gathered on campus last week in celebration of the Morrill Act's 150th anniversary. John Block served as Secretary of Ag under President Ronald Reagan, Nebraska native Clayton Yider during President George H.W. Bush, Dan Glickman under President Bill Clinton, and former Nebraska Governor and current Senator Mike Johans under George W. Bush. IANR Vice Chancellor Ronnie Green and Jeff Rakes, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, served as moderators for the discussion held at the Lead Center on UNL City campus. The four spoke about the current opportunities and challenges in agriculture and how the landscape has changed over the last century and a half. Measured against its scene in 1862, the agricultural industry is vastly different. There is bigger equipment, more income, but drastically fewer farmers. Not even 2% of Americans farm for a living today, compared to 60% when the Morrill Act passed 150 years ago. As four former U.S. Secretaries of Agriculture spoke on UNL's campus last week, they talked about the current issues facing agriculture, such as drought and the expiration of the Farm Bill. Yet they see a bright future for the small percentage of Americans involved in the industry. But I would suggest that the potential for great influence by the farmer and rancher has never, ever been greater in the history of this country. Mike Johans, Dan Glickman, Clayton Yider, and John Block talked for over an hour about the outlook of Nebraska's number one business. As those involved in that business battle a historic drought sweeping across their state, a question from moderator Jeff Rakes focused on the potential for a waiver to the ethanol mandate. Should we be waiving the renewable fuel standard uh, in a time of, of, of crisis that's shown in terms of the volatility on pricing? Not before the election. <laughs> Created in 2005, the Renewable Fuel Standard, or RFS, established a renewable fuel volume mandate of 7.5 billion gallons of renewable fuel blended into gasoline by 2012. The new standards increased the blend in transportation fuel to 36 billion gallons by 2022. 
But as drought conditions withered crops during the past months, some in the livestock industry who need to buy corn for feed asked for a waiver of the mandate. If I were sitting at EPA, I, I probably would say no to that as much as I'm sympathetic uh, uh, to the livestock and, uh, and poultry industries. Nebraska is as involved in both sides as any. As a state, it's the nation's second leading ethanol producer behind Iowa, and it also leads the country in cattle slaughter. But some analysts believe a waiver wouldn't do much to ease prices. It's questionable how much it'll accomplish. If they think by lifting it, all of a sudden we'll have all this corn, you're not going to. And if you did have all this corn for food, all of a sudden, gasoline prices would be $6 a gallon. So because 10% of our gasoline in our cars is ethanol. So, you know, you, you can't have both. Ought there be a time when the standard ought to be reduced and perhaps eliminated? Yes. I don't think it's quite yet right there yet. I don't think the industry is quite mature yet. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, these, these subsidies in whatever form you have them shouldn't last forever. Taking place only days before the expiration of the then current farm bill, the former secretaries fielded questions from the audience, including one regarding the upcoming lapse. Senator Johans, the secretary of ag from 2005 to 2007, cited the 2008 farm bill as a point of reference for the often missed deadline. This kind of time lag is not an unusual in a farm bill. The last farm bill was actually signed in, in the June, June 18th, uh, not signed, but approved in the uh, June 18th of the following year. So if you, if you put that into this time frame, we wouldn't have a farm bill to, until June of next year. While farm bills have a history, John Block was the only one of the panel to address a newer threat to agriculture. As we know about the livestock industry and potential regulation of the livestock industry, uh, around animal rights, animal welfare in particular. Are you concerned about the livestock industry's costs being raised in a way that it might be shipped offshore? The risk is if they are able to get the federal government to start writing laws telling the industry how to do this and how to do that. If you get the federal government into this, uh, then we got real problems. Based on the numbers, though, the industry of agriculture has weathered its challenges extremely well over the past 150 years. Even with fewer farmers, its place in feeding the world is more apparent than ever. The United Nations says food production must double by 2050 in order to meet the demand of a growing population. And that alone may help cement its success in the future. Look at where we are economically. We have the highest farm income in history. We have the highest exports in history. We have the highest cash income in history. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't problems, there isn't a drought, and there aren't uh, challenges, which there are. But, but I think what this recognizes is over the long term, agriculture and food is poised to be a very dominant industry in America. There are four former U.S. Secretaries of Agriculture from Nebraska, in addition to Clayton Yider and Mike Johans. Jay Sterling Morton and Clifford Hardin also held the title. If you want to see the full discussion from last Friday, you can visit hewermanlectures.unl.edu. The University of Nebraska must raise $5 million from private contributions for a new veterinary diagnostic center. In the October Nebraska Farmer, you'll read that the existing lab is overcrowded and doesn't meet the needs for today's enhanced animal disease diagnostic methods. Dave Harden, the director of the UNL School of Veterinary Medicine, says the 2012 Nebraska legislature approved $50 million in financial bonds to be appropriated over 10 years to build the new center. But a stipulation for the approval was that the university must first raise $5 million. The UNL Foundation is helping raise the money as part of its campaign for Nebraska. You can find out more information about the project in the October Nebraska Farmer. With corn and soybean harvest around the halfway mark now in Nebraska, some producers might be thinking about sampling soil to see which nutrients are still there after months of drought. We talked with UNL Extension soil scientist Charlie Wartman this week about whether to sample this fall or next spring and how this year differs from others. Well, the big difference is for our rain-fed uh, land um, where we had a poor harvest, uh, fewer nutrients removed than normal, and, and also with nitrogen, we had probably less leaching conditions this year. So with our rain-fed land, following corn and following sorghum, for instance, 
we're expecting that there is a good accumulation of soil nitrate out there, residual nitrate that our next crop could use. Um, therefore, it's something we do want to give credit to in making, determining our nitrogen rates for next year. If our next year, our 2013 crop is going to be another cereal, such as corn. Sure. If it's soybean, it's not much of an issue. You're recommending that producers wait until spring to sample. Why is the big issue waiting till spring? Well, it's a consideration. Um, we don't know what our precipitation is going to be in the, in the meantime. It could be that uh, some of this nitrogen that's in the soil now, if we do get extra heavy precipitation, that it could be leached out. On the other hand, if we may want to do some application on those dry land, uh, acres this year of anhydrous ammonia. This fall you mean? This fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, if in that case you do want to do your testing this fall to see how much how much nitrogen you have out there already. You always do have the option of doing a side dress application if you come right. up short. So you probably don't want to apply excessive amounts in any case this fall. But the risk is that you believe it could be more variable, your soil test could be more variable this fall in dry land situations? The variability could be there, uh, but again, it's going to be related somehow to your yield. If your crop was able to extract a lot of nitrogen, uh, then uh, we expect the nitrogen to be more depleted in those areas. And that could be, could be somewhat hit or miss in the fields as we've heard from yields. It could be. Uh, and um, so you might want to consider your yield map and doing your targeted soil sampling for residual soil nitrate. But generally with soil nitrate, we recommend that you sample at least to a two foot depth. And because of the, on the rain fed acres, because of the uh, shortage of water this year, there wasn't much downward movement of the nitrogen that two foot depth should capture what's there pretty well. What are the other nutrients that you're looking at and how they could have been affected this year as well? Well, phosphorus, potassium, uh, soil pH, these are properties that where the, the uh, soil test may not be very reliable this year because of the influence of the dry, very dry soil. Again, just for rain fed conditions. And so if you want to grid map a field, for instance, a rain fed field, I would suggest that you hold off on that for a more typical year because you're making, going to be making management decisions, you know, based on that information for five or more years. And so you want to have as reliable results as you can get. We do know, know that dry soil conditions can affect potassium in some cases. They can affect the soil pH. We also know that our dry land crops did not take up as much nutrients as they normally do. So there's more available pea out there and more potassium than we would normally expect to see. You can find out more information on soil testing in a recent CropWatch article online at cropwatch.unl.edu. Almost a year ago, we talked with UNL Extension educator John Wilson about flooding along the Missouri River. Affected fields contain feet of sand and considerable soil erosion. Governmental assistance wasn't a guarantee then, and cleaning sand off some of the ground was a monumental expense. Since those growers who did plant back into soils of a different makeup are now harvesting, we talked with John again this week at a field northeast of Tecama. Well, just uh, a quarter mile off to our, uh, um, our side here is, is the Missouri River Channel. Uh, if we were standing here this time last summer, the water would have been over our heads. That uh, uh, this area had uh, water on it, uh, standing uh, uh, five to six foot deep for the majority of uh, uh, three to four months during the summer last year. And the sand deposition was what along here and even worse as you get closer. Right, we were kind of on the edge of uh, the sand deposition here. Where we're standing, we probably had two or three inches of sand. Uh, as we get closer to the river, we have places where there were drifts uh, uh, 15, 20 foot deeper, deeper. What the yields end up like, this is an irrigated field. Uh, it's seed corn, beans, a buffer of beans, and then uh, field corn. What do the yields come out to be? 
Okay, uh, all that's been harvested so far is the seed corn, but on that, uh, we uh, got uh, probably about half a yield compared to what we would normally expect on this. Uh, we haven't gotten into the, the soybeans or uh, field corn yet, uh, so uh, that's what we're gonna be interested to see here in a little bit. The, the, the non-irrigated fields, what did they end up with? Uh, the that had the same deposition and the same characteristics. Yeah, it's kind of hard to, to say how they yielded compared to what they normally sure. would because of the of the drought this year. Actually, the drought probably balanced things out that uh, there probably wasn't as much difference as we would have expected in a in a normal year that uh, yields were were poor all over, but uh, uh, that uh, it kind of balanced it out so there might not have been as much differences. But definitely those grounds that were flooded, even if they just had water standing on them, no uh, uh, sand deposition, uh, still uh, yielded uh, uh, somewhat less than uh, those fields that hadn't been flooded. When we look at financial assistance, I know we talked a year ago and we talked about the possibilities for financial assistance farmers affected in this area. What did it come out with? Did anybody get anything out of it? Uh, they, they did. It, it was, it helped, uh, and this is, the assistance would be as far as uh, repairing ground that had uh, 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 sand deposition that had to be uh, removed, erosion that had to be uh, 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 corrected, and so uh, that I don't think anybody came close to uh, uh, recovering the actual expenses that they incurred, but at least it, uh, it helped with uh, the expenses some. Uh, from the uh, yield standpoint, uh, uh, for the crops that was actually lost, uh, that that uh, fell more on the, the crop insurance side. Did any farmers look at CRP or wildlife reserve? Uh, that uh, we have a few that have, that uh, uh, most folks that uh, uh, are, uh, are still, uh, anything that they can farm that they will, and, uh, but it may be, uh, we, and we really don't know for sure, but it may be three, four, five years or, or more before these fields get back to their normal pre-flood uh, uh, yield levels. What's the outlook for next year? There's a cover crop of rye here. Is that something you're looking to to try and recoup some of that, uh, the soil nutrients? Uh, not only nutrients, but one of the biggest things, uh, this is kind of an unusual flood because of its duration. Most floods uh, uh, come up, uh, crest, and uh, recede within 10 days to two weeks. Uh, this had, uh, a lot of these fields had water standing on them uh, three to four months. And so uh, one of the things that we really lost was the, the mycorrhiza in the soil uh, that, are, that live, actually benefit with the plant. It's a fungi that lives in the soil, but it assists with nutrient uptake. And uh, that, that is probably one of the biggest benefits of the, of the cover crops in that uh, with a living crop out there, a living plant, that's uh, what we need to get the, uh, the mycorrhiza population to, uh, to come back up. Tell me about the research plots you have and what you're looking at in case something like this would happen again. Right, that that was one of our biggest challenges uh, as far as uh, helping farmers as the floodwaters receded last year and uh, they were asking, well, what do I do next year uh, in the search of the, uh, of the uh, research that had been done in situations like that, there's very little that uh, had any research uh, done on uh, long-term uh, uh, long flooding sites. So we have uh, uh, plots out here and we have a similar set of plots uh, down in uh, Nemaha County. Uh, we wanted to get a couple of different sites, different situations, but uh, what we're looking at are several different uh, fertility studies. We're looking at uh, different uh, cover crops on both corn and soybeans, as well as uh, different sources of uh, inoculum on soybeans. Now to forecast the coming week, here's UNL Extension State Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we are again for the weekly forecast. Before we get to the main forecast, let's take a brief look at what's happened during this past week. Of course, last week I talked about the potential for a cold front to be moving in during the middle of the week with a much stronger reinforcing shot of cold air moving in as we approach the weekend. We did get the cold front coming in during the midweek period, but the reinforcing shot of cold air came in on Thursday instead of Friday. And what that ended up doing was creating an upslope flow condition across the panhandle, and we were able to generate the beginnings of some accumulating snowfall as we moved into late uh, Thursday night and early Friday morning, and that continued through most of the day Friday. And we we're seeing some, still some continuations of light snowfall across the panhandle with the heaviest accumulations across the northern half of the panhandle. And we do expect to see that snowfall end as the day progresses. 
for most of the state we're going to see a very cold weekend with a very strong possibility that most locations north of Interstate 80 are going to see a hard freeze with scattered frost to hard freeze conditions likely across the southern one-third of the state. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see as we progress through this week what we can expect. And as we go to the upper air models, the first thing I'll draw your attention to, here's that broad upper air trough with a very, very cold air that's moved in. We do have some energy over eastern Nebraska that's going to generate some light precipitation because we have such a dry atmosphere at the surface, it's going to have to overcome that. So a lot of the energy is going to go into moistening up the atmosphere before it gets to the surface. We still might expect to see maybe a tenth to a quarter inch in some isolated pockets. We also will be looking for this piece of energy moving through the panhandle that might reinvigorate some of the snow activity, but most of it is expected to end before noon. So we're looking at highs somewhere between the 40 to 45 degree range in the panhandle and the northeast. And as we get into the southern portion of the state where we'll see warmer air, we may make it up into the low 50s. Now, as we go into tomorrow, most of that energy is going to slide to the east. So we're still going to be under a cold northwest flow, so we'll be looking at highs in the northeast, somewhere between 48 and 52. And as we get into extreme southwestern and Nebraska and possibly even the southern panhandle, we might make it up into the low 60s. Now, as we go into Monday, we're going to see another piece of energy trying to drop south, where right now they're going to keep that coldness of that air to the east of us. We'll be looking at temperatures in the north around the mid-50s, and as we get into extreme southwestern Nebraska, we'll be looking at the upper 60s. Now, as we go into Tuesday, that cold air is going to just barely buffet the portions of north central and northeastern Nebraska, so we'll see temperatures drop back into the upper 40s, and as we go into the southern, extreme southern Nebraska, we'll be looking at much around the low 60 degree range, but I don't expect any precipitation with this system. Now, as we go to Wednesday, Wednesday, as that moves east, where we're going to start to see high pressure build in and warmer conditions, we're looking at highs in the upper 50s to low 60s across the northeast to potentially the 70 degree mark across south central and southwest Nebraska. As we go into Thursday, the ridge builds even farther. We get a little bit additional warm. We're looking at highs in the upper 60s across the northeast to approaching the 80 degree mark across the southwest. And as we go into, into Friday, we'll be looking at possibly even warmer conditions, low 80s to the southwest. And in the northern parts of the state, we're approaching the 70 degree mark. Eight to 14 day forecast keeps the cold air in place. And in terms of precipitation, we do show below normal precipitation, but there's a big upper air low that's expected to move out and increase our precipitation chances as the weekend progresses. Thanks, Al. To see segments or interviews from this or any show, you can log on to our Market Journal website or YouTube page. Next week, Wade Johannes from Central Valley Ag joins us to look at the October crop report and Curtis Harms reports on unwanted horses in Nebraska. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.